Library and Archivist for the Great Smoky Mountains National Park Collections Preservation Center, which is located over in Townsend. Um, Julie, our genealogist, and I'm glad she's here tonight. I can point her out. Uh, we met Mike a couple years ago at a uh, genealogy class, and ever since then, I'm a, I've wanted to have him come and explain about the collection center to the library here. So I'm glad that uh, we have him tonight because, you know, COVID hit. We didn't do programs, blah, blah, blah. So we're very glad he's here tonight. Um, I was looking on your website. The center has over 418,000 artifacts. Wow. And about 1.3 million archival records. Am I lying? 1.4 now. <laughs> 1.4 million archival records documenting the history of the National Park and other National Park areas in East Tennessee. Um, and they have a 14,000 square foot facility over there, so it's pretty impressive. So here is Mike. Um, just take it away. Thank you. Um, so have, have any of y'all ever uh, done research in the archives of the National Park before? Mm -hmm. Well, if you had, you'd know that we used to be located in the basement at Sugarland's Visitor Center. And in uh, 2016, uh, we moved into a new uh, purpose-built facility in Townsend. And uh, it's the National Park Service Collections Preservation Center. And uh, this is a purpose-built facility uh, as Christine said, it's uh, 14,000 square feet. Uh, it's climate controlled, it's uh, secure access, uh, and it's, uh, it was a four and a half million dollar uh, facility. Um, it uh, houses the collections for Great Smoky Mountains National Park uh, and the cultural collections from Andrew Johnson National Historic Site, uh, um, Cumberland Gap National Historic Park, Obed Wild and Scenic River and Big South uh, National River and Recreation Area. Um, as I said, uh, it was a four and a half million dollar facility and uh, it's a public-private partnership between uh, the National Park Service, uh, the Great Smoky Mountains Heritage Center who donated the land that the facility sits on. We're actually just kind of adjacent uh, to, to their land. Uh, the Friends of the Smokies, and the Great Smoky Mountains Association. So the Great Smoky Mountains Association donated the money for the facility, about uh, $4 million. Uh, the National Park Service oversaw the construction of it and they also designed the facility. Uh, and then they paid the, uh, the remaining $500,000 for all of the uh, storage carriages. We have compact uh, shelving uh, in the facility so we can maximize the amount of space that we, uh, that we have. Um, and uh, I am not a federal employee. Um, the Great Smoky Mountains Association pays my salary. Uh, I have kind of a unique uh, situation. I'm paid by them. I report to the National Park Service, but I'm, I'm sort of left to my own devices as long as I do my job and, and answer my research requests and process the collections and, and care for everything the way it's supposed to be cared for, then, then I, um, I won't say I have free reign, but I, I certainly have uh, the freedom to do the job that I need to do. Um, so a lot of people wanted to know why we would spend this much money to build a collections uh, preservation facility. And we have a huge collection of artifacts. Uh, as, as she's already said, uh, 1.4 million uh, records, 435,000 uh, historic artifacts. Most of those are uh, archaeological in nature, so it's a lot of pot shards and stuff like that. But we have about 38,000 uh, cultural uh, items in the collection. Those would be things that um, everyday use items like hose and shoe lasts and uh, textiles, quilts, quilt toppers, um, parts for uh, stills. We've got enough parts that we could almost fully assemble two stills in the building. Um, uh, so we needed to be able to prepare our, to, to house all that stuff properly. Uh, and over the years, our collections had been stored all over East Tennessee and Western North Carolina. Uh, initially in the 1930s, a lot of our collection items that were collected in the park were stored uh, in the uh, attic of the post office in Maryville. Uh, we had things that were stored in uh, the attic of a drugstore in Bryson City. Uh, then once the, the actual park headquarters buildings were, store, were built, uh, we were storing things in the attic at Econolufti. Apparently at one point, our, our collection of black powder long rifles were just stored in a barrel like you would store uh, 
brooms <laughs> in the attic. So, so we had a serious need for uh, a purpose-built facility that could, could appropriately and adequately house these items. Um, and we also needed to be able to provide researchers with a convenient place where they could come in and do research. Um, I get about 350 research requests a year, and um, about a third to a half of those actually come into the facility. And when we were located uh, in the basement over at Sugarlands, uh, in the visitor center, I had one table. I had one round table that I could put, fit one person at. So if I got more than two people in uh, at a time, one person would go in the basement and I would set the other person up in the uh, break room upstairs and they had to share space with all of the, the rangers eating their lunch while they were trying to do research. So this wasn't at all the, the best uh, uh, situation. Um, immediately before uh, the collections were moved to the new facility in Townsend, they had been stored uh, in Oak Ridge. Uh, for a while, they were stored at the Y-12 facility where the bomb was, was developed. Uh, they were stored in a, a, a building called the Mouse House, and uh, most of the facilities up there had some level of radioactive <laughs> contamination because of the, the work that was done to separate uh, uranium and, and, and basically develop U-238. The mouse house had uh, a mercury issue, so you could go into this room and literally mercury would, would run in little beads out of the walls. So we eventually um, moved everything over to another uh, Department of the Energy uh, Department of Energy facility, and it was just a giant office building, and we had uh, we had a, enough space that we could have our collections um, stored together, but we couldn't bring. Uh, researchers in because it's uh, it was a highly secured uh, facility we could go up and do work but it was almost impossible to have anyone from the public up there so there was a real need to have a, a centralized location uh, where we you know we can take care of these items we can be around them uh, every day if we need to be I mean, it was a three-hour round trip to go from Gatlinburg to Oak Ridge to work on something and you know when you've only got an eight-hour day take out you know 30 minutes for lunch and your day is almost already over uh, so it was really important that we built this facility in Townsend and um, I, I can say that it's just it's one of the nicest facility it is the nicest facility I've ever worked in it's the only purpose-built facility that I've worked in and it's one of the few that the National Park Service has in the southeastern region uh, we're able to you know shelled everything appropriately. You can see these are some of the, the mobile carriages that, uh, that we have. And um, it's just, we're able to, to see everything. It's secure, we're in a uh, climate controlled environment. We have one of the most amazing air filtration systems in the building. Um, we've been in there since 2016 and we do routine dusting, but we don't really even have to do that. The air filtration system is so, is so tight. Um, the, the filters for the system alone cost $35,000 to replace and we haven't yet had to replace them and we're, we're not anticipating that we'll have to any time in the next 10 years. Um, the, uh, the archives, the archival collection used to be housed uh, in Sugarlands as I said and it was absolutely the worst place for storing documents, anything made out of paper photographs or anything because every time we got more than an inch of rain in Gatlinburg the basement flooded and every time it rains you get more than an inch of rain in Gatlinburg so it was a constant battle against um, water we had rodent and insect issues because it's you know it's it's in the middle of a big field and, and we didn't have really good secure uh, pest monitoring or anything like that and uh, now we've got everything in this amazing facility and it's uh, uh, it's just fantastic. We have about 1183 linear feet of records in our collection and just to give you an example uh, the Eiffel Tower is just over a thousand feet so our collections if they were stacked up they would be taller than the Eiffel Tower uh, and it's just it's it's a great pleasure for me to go into work every day and, and be able to work in a building like this and it's it's not something that many people in my profession get to do um, 
This is our research room. When you come in to do research, I, I can accommodate eight people in this room. We have Wi-Fi. We have uh, we're above ground level, so you have light. Uh, we've got windows, and it's just it's a really nice, airy, comfortable place to come in and do research. And I'm hoping that one of y'all will want to come out after this presentation and, and see what we have to offer. Um, so, what uh, what can you find in the archives? Uh, as I said, we have uh, 1.4 um, million archival records, and that covers everything from uh, all of the land transaction documents. You know how the National Park was formed in order to make sure that the, uh, the officials representing Tennessee and North Carolina were dealing with the legitimate landowners. Every tract of land had to be traced all the way back to the original land grants if that was possible. So we have now, basically an unbroken chain of custody in the form of deeds uh, for all of the, the property that was purchased uh, for the establishment of the park. And that's uh, a huge treasure trove of genealogical information. I'm not a genealogist by any stretch of the imagination, but about 70% of the people that come in and do research, they want to do genealogical research. So uh, this is one of those collections that is very, very heavily used. Uh, we've got records for just about every logging company that operated in the park, um, especially during that uh, sort of classical commercial period from about uh, 1900 to 1930. Uh, so, you know, Little River Lumber Company, uh, Champion Fiber, we've got records for just about every one of the companies that had a major operation in the park. Um, We've got, also got all of the correspondence that the Park Service itself has generated, and that's actually the largest collection that we have. Um, our records for that go back to the 1930s, and we have uh, all of the superintendent's monthly reports uh, from uh, 1932 to 1968 when they stopped uh, producing monthly reports. We have uh, records from every division that operates in the park. Um, so if you want to come in and study the, uh, the decision-making process that the National Park has, uh, has used beginning in about 1932, we have all those records. Uh, and it's just, it's an amazing amount of information. Uh, and uh, it's one of those collections that I access on a very regular basis. Um, we have cemetery records for all of the cemeteries that are in the park. Um, we, we don't know who's buried in every cemetery because we've got a number of graves that are unmarked or the, the grave markers have disappeared over the years, but we have a very good idea of who is buried in the park. And that's, that's another genealogical uh, source for people. And then we have uh, the records from the Civilian Conservation Corps in terms of the work that they did in the park. Uh, we don't have their, uh, their enrollment records, those kind of things. Those are actually housed with the National Archives um, in Atlanta. Um, but uh, we have record of all the projects that they worked on in the park. We have a huge collection of photographs uh, that the Park Service took or that uh, individual enrollees took and then donated to us uh, later in their, in their adult lives. Um, The earliest record that we have in the collection is uh, from 1780, and it is a court order for the sale of property property that belonged to Thomas Early. And this is significant because it was signed by John Sevier, uh, who was uh, clerk of the Court of Washington County, North Carolina at the time. And he would, of course, go on to become uh, president of the state of Franklin, governor of Tennessee, senator, uh, and one of the most important early figures in state history. And we actually have about four documents that were signed by John Sevier or uh, relate to John Sevier. We have um, a couple from the, the state of Franklin and then uh, a couple from the uh, Revolutionary War era. Um, we've got a huge collection of maps. We have <coughs> thousands of maps, plans, and drawings in the park that cover everything from lumber company, uh, tract holdings, we have plats for every tract of land that was purchased in the park. Uh, we've got maps that uh, people made to show uh, you know, where their ancestors lived uh, 
in various areas of the park maps of the, the Sugarlands and Fighting Creek, um, Greenbrier. It's, it's just, it's really amazing the, the amount of information we have just in the maps alone. Um, we also have a very large historic photograph collection. Uh, we have about uh, 35,000 images uh, that cover early residents, uh, just about all of the structures that were standing in the park uh, at the time the park was established, uh, early ranger activities, um, natural history, mountain culture, and some really amazing images of the logging that was going on in the park. Um, and I've just kind of thrown up a, a few here. Uh, the Smoky Mountain Hiking Club, uh, Carlos Campbell and Dutch Roth, they photographed all over this area in the 20s and 30s, and we have thousands of photographs from them. Uh, and it's just, it always amazes me to look at these and see these people in ties and wool jackets and, and dresses and heels hiking through the park. And you would never catch anybody doing that today. Everything's got to be high tech and wicking and vibram sold, but it did not stop these folks. if you can see this very well it's uh i try to throw in a couple of images that are specific to the to the community where i'm doing a presentation i couldn't find that many on pigeon forge unfortunately but this is great this is the uh, the forge hammer uh from the the iron forge and uh it disappeared sometime after 1937 uh, at least according to our records i don't know if it was melted down uh in the war if it was you know part of the scrap drive or if it just ended up someplace and we don't have a record of it in the collection, but since it wasn't a collection item in the park itself, uh, I'm not surprised that we don't really know what happened to it. Um, several years ago, we started working with Clemson University, and they have come in and they have taken uh, 14,000 of our historic images and digitized them and put them online, and they're available on openparksnetwork.org, and um, they can be download them. They're 300 DPI JPEGs. Uh, they're very good quality scans, very good resolution, uh, and for the most part, all of the descriptive information, all the metadata is accurate. Uh, some of it's, you know, they digitized 14,000 images and got some things kind of backwards, but for the most part, everything's uh, uh, really well described. And these are like the, what we consider sort of the core primary um, images that we have in the collection. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Jim Shelton. He uh, worked for Little River Lumber Company. Uh, he married uh, one of the Walker sisters, and he was a, uh, a very talented uh, amateur photographer, and he took photos all over the area from about 1914 to 1925. And uh, we've got all those, all those online. We have uh, as many images of uh, former park residents as we had, uh, as we could get our hands on, we, we have those online as well. Uh, we also worked with uh, the Hunter Library and Western Carolina University. They came in and they took uh, primarily photographs and documents that are related to Western North Carolina history that we have. All that has been digitized and it's available online. They have almost as many paper documents as they have photographs, so if you're looking for reports and things like that relating to Western North Carolina. It's, it's, all, it's almost all on the, the Hunter Library website. Um, I guess it was in 2020, uh, the great granddaughter, Carlos Campbell, donated, um, see if I can figure out how to work this. Somebody well, okay. um, so anyway, uh, Carlos Campbell, who was one of the founding men members of the Smoky Mountain Hiking Club, he was a member of the Great Smoky Mountain Conservation Association, uh, and he was a, uh, an advocate uh, for the establishment of the park as well as an advisor to park management. Um, he was uh, another avid photographer in the area, and in 2020, uh, his uh, great-granddaughter donated 3,500 uh, medium format 
negatives and prints uh, to the archives. And these were all taken between about 1936 and 1938, almost all of them within the park. And it's, it's kind of a, uh, it's a bit of information that some of our other collections don't really touch on. Uh, one of the things we didn't realize was that Eleanor Roosevelt made several trips to the park between 1936 and 1938, and we have photographs of, of many of those trips. Um, we have uh, photos of uh, Chapman Highway under construction. Uh, it was you know, built when David Chapman was still alive. It was, it was named after him. Uh, we've got images of some of the old timer celebrations that were held in Gatlinburg. Um, just, it's, it's a wonderful uh, collection. And Western Carolina took all of those uh, negatives and they've scanned all of them. We have the digital scans of them and at some point in the future, they're gonna take a selection of them and make them available on their website as well. Uh, and I, I picked out some images uh, from this collection that I just, I, I really like. Um, this is one of the, the rolling stores from, uh, um, the Prince and uh, from the Fred mm -hmm. Ashley. Ashley Johnson. Yeah. Um, I guess sort of the area equivalent of the Watkins man that, that went around did the same thing. Um, this is a gas station at Tremont um, in, um, on the uh, middle prong of the Little River. Um, he just, he seemed to be all over the park all the time. And I, I don't know, I don't know how he did his actual full-time job because he was in the park constantly. Um, uh, this is great in case you can't read that it says uh, uh, erected in 1928 the sign reads Colonel Chapman you and host are notified let the cove people alone get out get gone 40 mile limit uh, 40 mile limit means don't come any closer than Knoxville basically and, uh, this this sign uh, is part of the park's collection and is now on uh, permanent exhibit at the uh, uh, Museum of East Tennessee History uh, in uh, Knoxville. And uh, of course he couldn't resist taking photographs of the Walker sisters either. Um, uh, we also have a very large collection of oral histories. We've got about 3,500 hours of um, recorded and transcribed uh, oral histories that go from about the late 1930s to 2009. Um, we've got the uh, Joseph Sargent Hall recordings, which are also available uh, from the Library of Congress. They're available on their website. Uh, CCC oral histories that were done in the 1980s at some of the uh, CCC uh, reunions that were held in the park. Um, and then Decoration Day projects, UT has come in uh, multiple times over the years and done oral histories with people. And then we have uh, a large oral history collection related to the Ravensford Land Swap that's on the North Carolina side. Um, uh, like I said, they've all, been, uh, they've all been transcribed, which is actually more important than the, the recording because it's much easier to go through a transcription than, yes ma'am. We have a collection of those that we went to the park and got when we opened in 2001. Okay. And they're right here on the shelf with the oral histories that we've done over the last 20 years. Oh. Too. They're just a treasure. I mean, they're just a treasure. But I, it's rare that a week goes by that I don't look at one of these oral histories for something. I was yeah. looking at them today before I, I left uh, work. Um, and they're, they're just fantastic. Um, we got a grant um, in 2014 to have all of our oral histories digitized. So we took everything down, not just our oral histories, but our oral histories uh, and a lot of the film footage that we have that was shot in the park. Uh, park service training videos, those kind of things. So those have all been digitized as well. They're not available uh, publicly. We don't have a, a you know a forward facing uh, website or anything like that, but everything is available uh, in the building on a server. Uh, so I can put them on a disc or a thumb drive and, and send them off. Um, one of the one of the downsides to being associated with a national park or a government agency like this is we don't really have the ability to do a lot of things digitally uh, that a lot of other organizations can do. And one of those is we just don't have 
uh, an effective way to share things with the public outside of someone contacting me and providing and I provide them uh, a digital copy of something we don't have a digital access management system that allows us to, to, to basically make things available to the general public uh, which is unfortunate um, and uh, this is just some highlights from the archives uh, in 2017 the descendants of Elijah Oliver donated uh, two leather wallets that they had found. And these aren't wallets like what we carry now, they're more like big billfolds. And um, there were 137 little individual pieces of paper folded up and shoved into these wallets. And this is what it looked like when I took them all out. Uh, and in order to have uh, an idea of what we had and to preserve them, I had to spend about three months painstakingly uh, restoring these these documents so what I did was each individual item had to be unfolded very carefully because they the earliest item in the dot in the uh, wallet was from about 1840 the most recent one was from 1905 and they had most of them hadn't been taken out of the wallet since about 1905 so they'd been in there a very long time they were, they were filthy they had pocket grit and, and leather dust on them so each one had to be individually cleaned um, special brushes and, and special erasers and then in order to flatten them I had to build a, a hydration chamber so I took a, a plastic tote like you would store sweaters in and uh, a plastic coated wire rack and a piece of muslin and I would wet the muslin down put it in the bottom of the container and then on the rack I would put a few little pieces of paper Put the lid on it seal it and every 15 minutes come back and check and see how much uh, moisture the paper had absorbed and once they had uh, absorbed enough moisture and relaxed i would take them out and then put them under sheets of blotter paper with weights on top of them and then every hour i had to come back and change the the blotter paper out until all the moisture was drawn back out of it and it took like i said it took almost three months to do this uh, but when I was done, we had one of the most amazing collections of ephemera uh, that we have anywhere in the archives. And ephemera is its the stuff that normally you would throw away. It's little receipts, little scraps, little notes, things like that. And what we ended up with was this really amazing uh, slice of life in Cades Cove. Um, letters... Uh, authorizing the county to pay the school teacher at Cates Cove Consolidated School. Or um, we discovered that Elijah Oliver was going to um, Maryville and paying his neighbor's taxes. And he you know, had the, the receipts for the taxes that he was paying. Is that, that one document, 1863? Yes, yeah. That's Whoa. a receipt. Um, and this is interesting. One of the other things that we found, we found uh, three good conduct passes that had been issued by the Union Provost Marshal in Knoxville. September of 1863, uh, Knoxville was uh, reoccupied by Union forces and stayed under Union control. So basically all of East Tennessee stayed under Union control. And in order for anyone to be out on the road conducting their business, they had to be able to prove uh, to sentries and soldiers that they were not Confederate spies or Confederate agents or deserters. And to do that, you'd have to petition the Provost Marshal in Knox Knoxville for a, uh, a pass, a good conduct pass. And it had a description of Elijah Oliver on it, uh, how tall he was, how much he weighed, what color his hair was, and granted him permission to be outside of Cades Cove doing business. And this is a receipt from, uh, I think it was from a store in Knoxville uh, where he had gone and bought, um, I think, a coffee pot and a comb and a couple of other things. Uh, and we, we have three of those passes uh, in this collection. And we, we had almost nothing from the Civil War before this was donated to us. Um, uh, one of the other things that we got were a couple of, uh, they're called voter attestation forms. So after the end of the Civil War during Reconstruction, in order to vote in elections, you had to prove that you had not been a member of the Confederate government or the Confederate military. And Elijah Oliver was able to do that uh, because he, he had been a Union supporter uh, and, and you 
know, stayed out of the conflict. So he he had these passes uh, or these forms that allowed him to, to vote in elections. And it's just information that we didn't really, you don't really think about those things sometimes. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was it was just amazing that uh, we were able to restore these items. And about a year or two after I finished this, we brought the family back in and showed them what had what we've been able to do. And they were so pleased with the care that we'd taken that they actually donated um, Elijah Oliver's bed to us, uh, the mm -hmm. bed that he died in. Oh, wow. uh, it, had, it was still in the family, and, and uh, we ended up getting that as, as a donation. And it's, uh, it's housed in the Collections Preservation Center now. Uh, we have a, a very small collection of 19th century Eastern Band of Cherokee Indian records. Um, and this is uh, this is two of the things that we have. We have. Uh, I'm not familiar. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Yonaguska. Yonaguska was the uh, the Cherokee leader who basically kept his his band uh, from being relocated to uh, Oklahoma during uh, relocation in the 1830s. And uh, we have uh, it's a photo of his pipe that we have uh, one of, one of his uh, ceremonial pipes. And then this is a, a letter that we have that was written uh, by his brother, Wilnota. And Yonaguska was a, uh, he was known as a, sort of a mystic. And he had a number of uh, visions and trances in his life. And this is a, a letter that uh, talks about some of those more important uh, visions that he had. And then the, the last of it is about his death. Uh, and uh, it doesn't exist anywhere else. It's awesome. It, it is. It's, it's, it's fascinating. Um, we've got a, a fairly large collection of ledgers you know, as well. So we have ledgers from uh, a lot of the stores that that operated in the park as well as, as in the region. And this is from um, a woman named Deborah McGee. And she lived in Waynesville, North Carolina. And she owned a, a drover's hotel. So when people would drive their, their cattle and their hogs to market, they would, they would stay overnight in her hotel. Um, but she also had a license to, uh, to sell and distill uh, liquor from the federal government. And she was only one of three women in Western North Carolina that was licensed to do this. And she would, she would buy uh, fruit, she'd buy cherries and plums and corn from her neighbors and then distill it into to brandy and whiskey and, and you know other hard hard liquor and then sell it. And all of these transactions are recorded in this ledger. And her neighbors were buying a lot of liquor. <laughs> it was kind of amazing. It was um, just medicinal purposes. Exactly, yes. Yeah. That's, yeah, for the rheumatids. Um, in addition to being licensed um, uh, to, to sell and distill spirits, she was also one of the first female postmasters uh, in North Carolina. And she was only one of 22 women across the country who were female postmasters. Um, again, during Reconstruction, after the end of the Civil War, you couldn't hold a position like postmaster if you had been a member of the Confederate military or a member of the Confederate government. And this was an opportunity for a lot of women to step into uh, federal jobs. And she was one of the first women in Western North Carolina to do that. Uh, she was just, she was a fascinating woman. And I was going through this ledger and I get to this line written in a hand other than hers. And it says, uh, uh, Mrs. Deborah McGee, uh, sorry. Died, 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 at, Waynesville. Yeah, died at Waynesville, uh, North Carolina, about half past 12 o'clock AM, uh, May 17th, 1880. Wow. Um, and, uh, it's, uh, it was a very sad, sad note to run across. Yes. Some, some years back, I had to take an additional history course in college, mm -hmm. and I opted to take the history of the South after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And the first night of class, the professor who had done a lot of historical research asked how many people in the class had been born uh, after 19, uh, before 1947. Mm -hmm. And there's several of us raised our hand, and he said, congratulations, you were born in the Reconstruction era. 
apparently, according to the research he had been doing, he wrote a book on it, I guess, the South did not totally recover and be fully restored back after the Civil War till 1947. Huh. Now that, that just blew my mind. I mean, I grew up in the South and right. we were poor as church mice right. in the 40s. And so it was believable to me because of the way we, if we didn't grow the food, we didn't eat. Right. You yeah. Know? So I, I just, this, this fascinates me. Unfortunately, uh, and don't shoot me, my great grandfather, uh, was in the Confederate infantry and he mm -hmm. was from McMinn County mm -hmm. and was at Vicksburg. Mm -hmm. Apparently when they were repatriated after Grant let them go, he only went back as far as Arkansas. He never came back to Tennessee. Mm -hmm. There was nothing left here right? because of what you've just outlined. Uh, if you were part of that force or a member of the Confederacy, you were practically an outlaw. You, you, had you, to. you weren't going anywhere. Yes. Yeah, you had to find another way. Yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. Or you wound up being bankrupt like my family. <laughs> well, they, I mean, they paid all their land taxes, but it was paid with Confederate scrip. Right. So it wasn't worth anything. Now you, now all of a sudden you're losing your land because you didn't pay your taxes. Yep, that's you true. Yeah, that's very true. So. Um, one of the other things we have, and this, this is one of the, I think, for me anyway, this is one of the most important pieces that we have. This is the ceremonial ostrich quill pen that uh, Tennessee Governor Austin P. used to sign the 1925 legislation that authorized the purchase of Little River Lumber Company land. And that became the seed that the National Park grew around. Wow. Uh, and um, it, this, this entire process was started by a woman uh, from Knoxville. Her name was Ann Davis. Uh, she was the, the wife of Willis Davis, who was owner of the Knoxville Iron Works. He was a philanthropist. Um, and they had taken a trip to the Western National Parks in the early 1920s. And on the train ride back, Ann said, you know, it would be really nice if we had a Western style national park in the Southeast. And this wasn't a new idea because it had been an idea that had been kicked around since the 1890s. But when they got back to Knoxville, Ann Davis decided, I'm gonna run for office. Uh, and if I'm elected, the legislation that I'm gonna put forward is the purchase of Little River Lumber Company land to establish the park. And she ran in 1924. In 1925, uh, she was elected in 1925, she got the legislation passed. And there's a photo of uh, Austin P. signing the, the legislation with that pen and, and Ann Davis is immediately behind and is she the one in white or the one in the with she's the, fur the one with the fur yeah okay. um, and so two things really helped her do this one was the um, the realization that if the natural wonders in this area weren't conserved they would be consumed by the lumber, lumber companies the logging was just destroying this area so there was a conservation movement at the time she was also able to leverage the fact that the 19th Amendment had been passed in 1920, ratified by the Tennessee State Legislature, mm -hmm. and that allowed white women the right to vote. And she was able to use that to get into office. She spent one term in office. This was her major legislation, but she also did a lot of things for um, uh, children and, and indigent women in Knoxville and really made a huge impact on the area that we live in now. And that's, that's why I think this is probably one of the most important items that we have uh, in the collection, because if it hadn't been for this woman and this governor who supported we her- We wouldn't have a park. Exactly. So who can access the collections? Anyone can. These are, these are public records. Um, we hold these in trust for the American people and it is my responsibility to make sure that there are as few impediments as possible between researchers and access to the material that we have. Uh, the only thing I ask is that you make an appointment. Uh, I'm the only person in the building that works with the researchers and we're far enough out the, outside of the orbit of the park now that I don't have as many drop-ins as I used to. But when we were in the basement at the visitor center, Every day, I'd have half a dozen people that would come down, and, and I'd, I'd have to 
tell them you need to make an appointment. But uh, if you give me a call, send me an email, um, I can I can do everything in my power to help you get the information that you're looking for. A lot of times if we don't have the information, I can direct you to another repository that, that may have it. And that's my contact information. Um, any questions? And I've got cards if you don't want to write that down. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, I don't, I want to come and just see. Okay. I mean, I, for me, I don't know that there's any of my family that were here because they settled from North Carolina into uh, McMinn County. Mm -hmm. So I probably would not be able to research anything about my family here. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I have an intense curiosity over the artifacts and the things just like that, the history right. of the area. Well, um, one thing I should mention is we aren't a traditional museum facility, so we don't have any exhibit space or right. anything like that. Um, we work with other um, local museums to, to display items. Right. Uh, we have a, a, a regular rotating exhibit with the uh, Great Smoky Mountain Heritage Center uh, at the Sevier County Visitors Bureau right now. There's some artifacts on exhibit. Uh, we have things on display at the uh, East Tennessee uh, History Museum. And I think we work occasionally with some folks in North Carolina. We, we as well. had some rather unusual things out here in the hallway too. <laughs> I mean, it, they might be recognizable as. <laughs> we, we need a little bit more security than than sitting out in the hall, but mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we we do work with a lot with yeah. local institutions. Yeah. Uh, so, if you wanted to come in and look at uh, artifacts, like for example, if you wanted to come in and see um, the uh, black powder long rifles that we yeah. have. You would make an appointment with the uh, museum curator mm -hmm. uh, and he would help you with that uh, the archives are in what's called a closed stack environment right so I'm the only person that's authorized to, to pull items for people well you sure don't want the, the average people trooping through there the, no. the atmosphere in there is so sensitive that right you, yeah bringing all their stuff in would not be good but we do tours like for organizations Great Smoky Mountains Association Friends of the Smokies uh, we um, we do tours for civic organizations mm -hmm. and things like that. So if you're a member of a civic organization. Or a genealogy group. We, yeah, we can do genealogy groups as well. Um, D-A-R. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We have it, yeah. but, but uh, you know, yeah. we can. Um, it has to be Monday through Friday during business hours. Uh, and I know that's kind of limiting for some folks. How, many, how many people I'm sorry. do you, how small a group do you need it to be? Um, we don't. If we can keep it to under 30. Oh, that, I was that's thinking it was 10. Yeah, me too. No, if, if we're going to do under 30, 30 that's we'll, we'll split it up. Uh, the curator will, will take half, I'll take half. We'll go through our respective areas and then swap out. Uh, we just had a, a big tour uh, last Friday with our resource education folks. Uh, so when there's new uh, seasonal new hires uh, in the park, we'll bring them into the building and, and we'll have exhibit you know, artifacts out. And things the like very that. fact that you have this building, that you are conserving a huge amount of history that otherwise would be totally lost or plowed under mm -hmm. or some development out there, a Walmart in the middle of the, you know, yeah. is, is awesome. I mean, it really is. And it's, thankfully we're doing that up here. Yeah, I, I'm glad that we are. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I didn't realize this, you said this tonight, but okay. My family's from Greenbrier, Huskies. I, I think I think someone in my family had like the picture of like they know what they sold their land to the park mm -hmm. and stuff for. But so is this where these original things are housed? Though it's, was it, see I didn't realize that till tonight that that's where they're actually housed yeah. now. Yep, we have. I think that's very cool. We have no, all that to seal it back, Martha. I don't want to seal it, but I would like to have a picture of it. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can I can scan it and send you a PDF or right. a JPEG oh, or whatever cool. you want and. Uh, uh, I, like I said, I work with the land transaction. I would just like to know that it's over there. I just think, I did not realize oh, sure. that's where it was housed. Cool. Yeah, if, mm -hmm. and if you send me an email, I can, you know, I, I can't do it until Thursday. Oh, no. But I can. I can, <laughs> I can My see. Joe has done so much research and done so much writing okay. over the years. I'm sure she's already got it because I think she showed it to me, but I just didn't know that's where it lived. Yeah. I didn't know that's where it was. Yeah, it's, you know, one of the, the, the records for the Tennessee side are actually a little bit easier to navigate yeah. than the ones for the North yeah. Carolina side. 
but one of the things that we have that I think is, is really fascinating is we have these, uh, there are these large index cards for each tract of land in Tennessee that was sold, and it lists all the improvements that were on the tract, um, how much the, uh, the initial uh, offer was or how much the appraisal was, and then if there was any negotiation, right. it'll all be listed on there. And it's, it's great. Our archaeologists like to use that information because they can see, it's like, okay, well, over here, there should be the foundation for not just this building, but there should be a spring house and there should be, you know, maybe there was a, a tub mill here or, or whatever it happened to be. Uh, so it's, we've got a lot of information. I mean, there's the, one point four million records. Something there's, tells me that you've only barely scratched the surface out there in the park as big as it is. Oh yeah, and you know the we went through a period of uh, a couple of decades where there was almost no archaeological mm -hmm. work being done in the park, and that's that's changed. In the I've been here ten years, and that really started to change about fifteen years ago. So there's more investigation, mm -hmm. uh, and and you know that's happens every day now. So it's it, it's pretty cool. It, it's I think you should let people know. I don't think people understand that for a tiny little library, we just were built in 2001, but everybody here was local. Our director, our genealogist, our historian, from day one, they wanted to start doing oral histories. They came to the park. They caught a couple of years. We have a lot of those maps you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I don't think people realize what a good resource we have right here if this is your roots. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. If you're in the park, so I was gonna say. We have a wonderful, wonderful, I went down, I mean, I lost a good afternoon down the rabbit hole of this map that we have on um, the City of Pigeon Forge website under the historical yeah. section. Yeah. And um, it is the national park by the plots of land, yep. by the people who owned it. We probably got it from you guys. I'm not sure where we got it. But when yeah. you click on it, even like, you know, Mr. Whaley that had 2.3 acres had to get talked to just the same way the people who had 35,000 acres right. on top of Leconte mm -hmm. and was a textile or a fiber mill had to get talked to to get their land acquired. And when you look at this m overall map and you see what had to happen to for every little piece of land, every little individual family you know, to come and get talked to and discuss, you know, and sell their, their property. Um, it's just fascinating to see yeah. all those big and little areas that... And it happened quick. It's, yeah. They started in the... Like, I don't even think we could pull this off now. Right. I really don't. And, all I mean, right. this was yeah. all, you know, horseback and, yeah. you know, I, I don't think our government could pull off well, but the way they had to have that hap happen. It wasn't the government that did it. Well, that, no, that's true. That's it true. Was, it was the, the it was the people. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was the the nonprofit, the uh, Tennessee Parks Commission and the North Carolina Parks right. Commission that did all the work. Right. Uh, and and those folks, I don't know if they were even paid for what they did. Right. But they did it really quick. They started they did. in about 1927, and they finished in about 1935. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of land to buy. It in, was in a small amount of time. And, and it's interesting that this is the only park in America. It's free. There's no fee to come in here. Right, yeah. Almost all the other ones, you're going to pay something. And everybody says, well, what about these parking things? I think that's only if you're planning to park on the, yeah. it's somewhere yeah, on the, the on the, the in the park park itself. Park. It, if it's, you're going to park, park control the traffic thing. Right. Yeah. But that's not a fee to get in the park. It's absolutely, right. and to my knowledge, it's the only national park in America that's free. It's the only big one. <laughs> the only big one. It's pretty big, yeah. and it's the most visited part it is. of it is. all of them. Well, and if when the the state of Tennessee transferred ownership of Highway 441 to the federal government in the late 1940s, it was with the stipulation that there would be no no tolls or fees to travel the roads, and that's why we don't have it. That's why. Fee. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, that's what I was saying, but it, yeah. it's, it's, it's yeah. to do, if you're just passing through the park. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. And I, I came through there. Pass through the park and I, I, saw, the I came through, through there about. You, you can if you're headed to the casinos. Over there. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you save your money one. so you can lose it over there. Mm -hmm. I, I, I came through the park last fall. And I happened to see something that was so cool. I couldn't get over fast enough to take a picture. It was a 12-point buck elk mm. wow. with his with the mama elk and the two little children over there. 
And the only ones that were frantic about looking at all these people looking at them were the little babies. It's like they couldn't figure out what these things were because right. they didn't have enough legs. But mom and daddy were, and this buck was just standing there. He wasn't any further from me to that counter over there. Yeah. And he was just this calm, but that was the most gorgeous animal I have ever. Huge, well, I mean, he was chunky, shiny, mm -hmm. and that rack, oh man. I was well, like going, Whoo! I got to do something last week. I've been here 10 years, and I got to do something last week I've never done before. And I got to go to a bear workup. So they, they caught a bear at um, the uh, Sugarland Riding Stables. Uh, it had been trying to get into cars. So they baited it, which they use Krispy Kreme donuts, I found out. Works for people too. So they, they tranquilized it, and then they, they did a, a full workup on it. And they, took samples and they chipped it and they tagged its ears and they gave it a mouth tattoo and, and all this stuff. And I'd never seen one like that. Wow. And, I mean, we all got to put on gloves. And then they and relocated him somewhere away from... Yeah, they took him over to uh, Cherokee National Forest mm -hmm. and let him go. So, wow. Uh, but it's got a GPS collar, so there was someone that's going to be studying this bear's movements mm -hmm. based on the GPS collar. It's just, it's, it's pretty fascinating. I know when I was growing up, they used to relocate locate bears underneath helicopters. Does anybody else remember that here when I was a kid? They would, when they would relocate, they would do the workup, they would tranquilize them while they were still out, they would put them in the net. Yeah. And that's and how they would relocate them. the bears from one part of the park to a different section right. of the park. They would have the net hanging below the helicopter. So if you saw a helicopter, you know, the 50 feet down, there's this little black there's dot. <laughs> so, you know, sway, and you knew they were relocating a bear. Right. Well, I'm not right, sure when that stopped. Right but. down, if you go down and like you're going to go on the road that parallels this, here's the all of us, and there's a road over there. Mm -hmm. Get ready, is that Community Drive? Uh, mm -hmm. Down the corner, down there, just uh, before you get to the school. I'm coming back one day, and there's this little yearling. Well, I thought it was a bear statue, and then it's ear moved. It was a little yearling. Apparently, the mama and something had passed through, mm -hmm. and he got separated. And of course, he startled and ran back into the woods there. And I called the police officers. And I said, "What do y'all do?" And he said, "We don't do anything. Just leave him alone." He said, "Come dark, they'll go on about their business." But yeah. the only thing I was concerned about was about the time the school was let out. Oh yeah, yeah. And but he was he was a yearling. He was not you know pretty good size. Now my neighbor tells me we had one walking down the street in our subdivision here. Oh, man. They're out and about for sure. Through, uh, well, look know. at the one that went into stores mm -hmm. in Gatlinburg. <laughs> oh, was he really shopping? Huh? <laughs> he, was. he was. Well, they're hungry. I mean, you know, we've, we've invaded their space. And, yeah. you know. Are you good? Anybody yeah, got any other questions? Or no, questions? I mean, this is, this is fun. Well, well thank you all thank for coming tonight. Coming. We've got a little paper there. If you would... Be so kind if you feel like you'd like to give a little uh, feedback. We're trying to figure out what people would like to see and more, more adult this. programs and more, more of this. What, I know, I agree. Yeah, I agree. I mean, Let's just keep him. Um, yeah. So, when thank you, you guys for coming from tonight. What you're doing? You know? <laughs> yeah, I probably won't come back to Pigeon Forge. I lived here for two years, <laughs> and yeah. we live right off of uh, Stoplight One. Oh, and wow. My wife was traumatized by it. So. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're probably just going to travel when he retires anyway. He's yes. probably not going yeah, on a lot of work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is some other historical place in uh, England. Yeah, I've, I've yeah. never yeah. figured out why my yeah. family, why I have a great grandfather that was on the other side. Ah. Uh, I mean, unless, uh, the, unless the conscriptions came through there and said, you're going with us or else. Yeah. You know, and that happened a it lot. Did. I mean, whoever, if the Union came through, they took it. If the Confederates came through, it was either do that or lose everything you had, including your own life. I found that. I found a document in my family history where that where that was the case. He had to take an oath, and he had to swear to the Union, yeah. and then he couldn't go below the Ohio River or something. He had to stay up, up, up north, north, and I didn't, I was like, well, they're afraid if he came back, he'd, he'd switch sides. Yep, yeah. yep. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Well, no, it's not. You, when I was doing Thank some you research that. over Mobile, they have a huge genealogy.